sky looked down on all the people looking up at the big sky. Everybody's pushing one another around. All right, welcome to Two Months Review. This is Chad. I'm here, as always, with Brian. Hi, guys. And this is our weekly podcast in which we read a single novel over a two-month period, taking time to analyze, talk about it, enjoy it bit by bit. And this, right now, what we're reading is The Invented Part by Rodrigo Frezan. And today, we're going to be discussing the third section, A Few Things You Happen to Think About When All You Want to Think About Is Nothing, which covers pages 231 through 300. And today, our special guest is Jonathan Lethem, who probably doesn't need any introduction, but just in case, he is... I actually will need an introduction, so... <laughs> okay. So, Jonathan... You know, is... I'm always interested to know what, what, you know, what the current introduction consists of, so... Oh, okay, perfect. So, I, I wrote down... Well, okay, this is, this is, that is the absolute perfect thing to say, because I have a question for you. So, he's the author of, of 10 novels, including Motherless Brooklyn, which won the National Book Critics Circle Award... Fortress of Solitude, Chronic City, and most recently, A Gambler's Anatomy. He's got five short story collections, uh, a bunch of essays, including two nonfiction books, and wrote the comic book Omega the Unknown, which is fantastic. And um, also, the thing I found out today, which I was going to ask you about, because I had never heard of this before, was uh, Believe Nicks. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, right, so um, Chris Sorrentino and I are both uh, lifelong Mets fans, and we... Um, it, so it's, it's really starting to be very uh, arcane. But do you remember that um, the Red Sox, uh, the, the the same year that their curse finally broke, that two long suffering Red Sox fans, um, uh, Stuart Onan and Stephen King, decided to chronicle the season, and they were, of course, they were going to write a, like a book about their their long suffering loser team, and then their team won the World Series, and they had this <laughs> triumphalist. <laughs> book, which was also a giant bestseller because everyone was excited because the Red Sox won the World Series, and also it was Stephen King. So it just goes to show, if you're a winner, you stay a winner. You can't help being a winner, and you're Stephen <laughs> King. So <laughs> Sorrentino and I uh, decided to kind of uh, satirize this, but also, you know, uh, call, call the world's bluff. Maybe if we decided we were going to write, two, two loser no novelists were going to write a book about their loser team, and then it, it would win the World Series. So we we, we decided to, to pick a random season, which was the, the present season of the work of the Mets. You know, they were they were interesting that year. Yeah. Uh, it was uh, you know, we had some we had a little little bit of mojo and, and actually went to the playoffs the following year. Yep. And lost uh, to the Cardinals and lost to the Cardinals in seven games. We had a game at which Chris and I were there together. Oh, oh really? Curs cursing their chances. Of course, we should never have gone. <laughs> uh, but so but we, we decided to do it not as ourselves because uh, it, it wasn't twisty enough. So we, we made up these two guys who were even worse loser writers than we were, who, who kvetched about the Mets and also about everything else. And, and these guys were the belief Nick. So in a way it was a, it was a, a fictional book about a real year in the life of a real sports team, because the, the narration was fictional because it was these two weirdos, uh, that we, we invented, but they were really sort of, uh, you know, uh, parts of ourselves, um, very on PC kind of, uh, I rate, you know, um, uh, my guy was a poet and I inserted all these satirical poems about the Mets where I would do like a Wallace Stevens poem. And, oh God. Uh, yeah, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> it was a, a spectacular failure. The only book I've ever had to go into paperback. Uh, oh my God. So there was a hardcover first printing and, and that was it. You guys, you guys can bring it out if you want. And, and, uh, I would, I would love to, I'm a huge baseball fan and like that I spent way too much time thinking and reading and talking about baseball. And I, when I found this, I was like, this is the coolest thing I've ever seen. Well, like, I guarantee you, you can buy a copy on Amazon for a penny. <laughs> <laughs> They they do. I, I like on Amazon that you have one and a half stars. <laughs> <laughs> three reviews. Three reviews. Yeah. One well, that no, was three stars this, and two. This, the weird thing about Believe Nicks is um, it's if you it, it's a, it was a really weird uh, thought experiment because if you if you make up fake authors and you write a, a book that's a, a a transparent piece of idiocy. Um, anyone will blurb it. All you have to do is tell them you don't have to read it, just blurb it. And so it has the most, when you get a copy, you'll see it has like the most unbelievable roster of blurbs ever assembled, including Stephen King. Because, 
We, wow. Chris and I just sent it to all these people and said, this book is a joke and it's meant to be ridiculous. And you can even say how, 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 how terrible it is or how much you hate the Mets in your blurb, say anything you want. And so we got we, the entire back cover is cover is full of, you know, um, Rick Moody and, and it just goes, you know, uh, David <laughs> Gates and, and, and both Stuart Onan and Stephen King. But, <laughs> but blurbs, blurbs do not sell a book like that. Maybe they sell <laughs> any kind of book, but they certainly didn't, uh, you know, this, so this um, is incredible. And actually, blurs is a perfect segue. But I do want it before before I let Brian take this over, or he's going to do it later. I do have to say that one of the one star reviews on Amazon has this amazing title that just says "A book about the Mets." I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> Boom! <Yeah. laughs> Hot take. There it is. That's fantastic. Now, how did you get into the Chipwich Writing Colony? I have uh, <laughs> applied there several times, never heard back. That, I think that's Sorrentino's joke. The oh, okay. <laughs> oh, yeah, because I, I have gotten in, you know, and uh, he, yeah, yeah. so he's, he's bitter. Um, <laughs> So I, uh, I remember when Chris wrote all those fake reviews on Amazon for Sound on Sound. Yes, they're incredible. He was he was he was the secret genius of of Amazon for a while there. I mean, there's there are all sorts of weird trails you can follow. I mean, I'm, probably most of those reviews have been deleted by now. But oh, it's unfortunate. But they're so good. Yeah. Um, so how did you how did you 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 actually speaking of blurbs are <laughs> you have a blurb on the front cover of the invented part which we we put on there which I put on there. Um, which I got from Rodrigo. So how did you how did you come to know about Rodrigo's work? And I believe you interviewed him at Penworld Voices, right? We did a conversation at Penworld Voices, and we had met through a well uh, intimate social sphere. My my sister uh, now what about fifteen years ago fell in love with a um, a, a Catalonian. A uh, writer and translator named Javier Calvo, right. and he and Rodrigo are friends. And I think I met. Uh, so I mean, they fell in love at a conference that I'd been invited to in Barcelona. It was me and four other American writers, um, and it was a kind of really strange. You know, if you just bring one young American writer to a you know Spanish city, and and it's just a it's just a book tour. But if you bring five. It's like it. Be, it was like weirdly like some sort of generational like uh, claim being made, even though the the five of us had never been roped together exactly before, and it was very disconcerting. It we ended up being like team interviewed by the Spanish literary press, so we'd all be seated at a podium in a row like the Beatles or something, and um, and it was me and Heidi Julevitz and uh, um, uh, Michael Shaban, and um, and those were to who I'd, I'd known somewhat already and had some kind of, you know, I identified with them loosely in, you know, uh, we, we, we'd been in approximate conjunctions before in the United States, but then the other two were David Sedaris and Chuck Palahniuk, neither of whom I'd met. And suddenly the five of us were speaking as, as though with one voice, because that was how it was being taken by the, um, you know, or how it was being framed by my, by, I guess we had the same Spanish publisher at that time. Um, and, uh, both, uh, Chabi, who became my brother-in-law, and uh, uh, Rodrigo were there, quite embarrassingly, to witness this this really <laughs> bizarre kind of um, piece of performance art in the in the name of American uh, literary Im- ambassadorship. And um, you know, uh, they would go out with us at night and and explain to us why the things we were saying didn't wouldn't make any sense to to people once they were translated into Spanish, and but that was okay. <laughs> um, and and I, Rodrigo and I just immediately had like a a a, a real. Uh, I mean, I I uh, tend to discount generational affiliations, uh-huh. but he and I clicked generationally. Really, we just our our relationship to certain emblematic pieces of popular culture and to literary culture just seemed to align. And we really had a, lo- a lot to talk about in particular, uh, you know, uh, horror films and, you know, oh, uh, yeah. Philip K. Dick and, and, and so on and so forth. So we just got along. And, and um, in fact, my sister and, and her uh, soon to be husband, Javier Calvo began to sort of, make fun of us for, you know, being like one another's international counterparts. Like we were nerdy in, 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 in exact same way. So I, I do feel like Rodrigo's some kind of, um, uh, mirror for me of, of what I might've been like, you know, uh, 
growing up in, uh, well, you know, his, uh, of course, nothing could, could duplicate his trajectory. Uh, I mean, the other thing, of course, was Bologna was breaking in that period. Right. And that was tremendously interesting. I, I became um, involved in the, the Bologna boom as it reached the English language because um, I reviewed 2666 for the New York Times. And, um, and Rodrigo had been his friend. And so this was, you know, this is another thing that, uh, we talked about and that bound, bound us together. Of course, I had the appalling problem, which happens to me, uh, whenever I'm in Europe that, uh, interesting, um, it, you know, uh, European writers will have read me and I can't have read them because they're not translated. So I was yeah. waiting and waiting for a chance to read Rodrigo. And then FSG did, uh, did did that that uh, first book and um, um, Kensington Gardens and I and I, I got to uh, read it which I I did I devoured it and I wrote that blurb to help it out and you know and so anyway we're 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 uh, what are we running mates that's in, really cool in an election that will never occur um and yeah and running, that makes a lot of sense like knowing uh, knowing both of your work and sort of knowing both of you ind- independently, like it, that seems like a, a match made in heaven in a lot of ways. That the two of you would, would get together in Barcelona. That makes complete sense to me. I, uh, I, I, he's also just, I mean, he, well, you know, Rodrigo is now I, you've made me self-conscious cause he's, you told me he's going to be listening in. He's, <laughs> he's a, he's a, uh, a mensch. He's, he, he, he sweeps you up in his world. Very un, you know, he's very unabashed and enthusiastic and un, un defensive about, the writing life. And so he just, you know, he, he, he made it easy for us to hit it off. Which makes sense. And that does tie, tie into with this particular chapter, which we finally, I'll sort of recap it real quick and then we can just go off in other directions. But, um, then that's in which this is the first chapter in the book in which we meet the writer as a fully formed writer. Um, we've seen him as the boy. We've seen him as like the people, the young, the young man, the young woman sort of making the movie about his life. And now we have the writer himself, um, who's finally like on the page and is on the page having like a basically like a psychosomatic breakdown, um, thinking that he's going to die because there's like pain in his chest and he's going to go down to the hospital. And when he gets there, he starts inventing all these all these stories and sort of they're all they all, which all tend to be like meditations on death or the loss of a child or the loss of a father or various yeah. things that are related to that. Um, and then to find out that like nope, he's fine, it's all good. <laughs> <laughs> he can go on, go on his way, and it, it's 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 a fun chapter, I think, like a really enjoyable one in which it, you get to see like all these things popping out and all those kind of creative bits, and it is like the writerly life is this uh, distilled in a way. Yeah, well, I mean, it's 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 uh, it's a great example of Rodrigo's work, and it's it's you know it's I mean, it's really it's a chapter. It's like a novella as mm-hmm. well, as a chapter, and that's the thing is he's such a he works he's such a maximalist. He's so he's so generous, and his work is so abundant in referentiality and and um, humanity. And you know this this chapter itself is like a, a a chapter in a larger work that's a part of a what a trilogy. How many books are there? Yeah, it's going to be a trilogy. He's finished the second one, and the third one he's writing right now. And yet, it could be a novella on its own. And within this novella is trapped. Uh, 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 you know, in crystallized form, like a whole anthology or a whole a cycle yeah. of short stories that are, you know, not quite written but might have been written, and and this this just this generosity of invention and and um, the the mind cascading with you know uh, possibilities and interest and and discoveries and you know just responsiveness to the universe is so uh, marvelous. But here it, it's you know you called it a fun chapter. Here all of that is also. Uh, counterpointed with the cruel um uh, stark fact of you know death that yeah. melody is going to come and and shut all this this uh the cyclone of of responsiveness down the That's body nice. is going to take the brain with it when it goes and this is you know this is the writer's nightmare and he rehearses this in various forms he has the pain in his chest but there's also the um, meditation on, you know, most people fear cancer. I feel fear even worse Alzheimer's. Yeah. And, you know, this, um, 
And and I think it's a very, you know, I, I, I'm not presuming anything or alluding to anything because I don't know what Rodrigo's uh, intimate experience with, you know, uh, midlife uh, crises of more, you know, glimpsing one's mortality might consist of. But it's a very subject very close to me. I'm a 50 something writer. I've also, you know, I've hospitals have been a, a part of my my experience, both as a child and, and as an adult. And, um, I, you know, the the. The simple actuality of the person in the waiting room whose mind is is careening yeah. uh, in this way with a beautiful expressivity, but also in a panic because this might be, you know, you, the, you might be glimpsing a horizon line. And yes, you do think of a hundred novels and a hundred stories that you could have written or should have written all at once, you know, and, and it reminds you of your own powers, but it's, 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 it's because of the terror of, of the you know, um, uh, you know, going away. And, you know, even anesthesia, the, the way anesthesia is different from sleep. <laughs> oh God. <laughs> I sleep. love it. I love going to the hospital. It's the only chance I get to do good drugs and not get in trouble. <laughs> there are, there are good drugs there. Yeah. And, uh, and anesthesia is a great trip. I mean, actually I, this, this chapter <laughs> reminded me of, um, of, of something in my own experience, which was that I, I, I thought up motherless Brooklyn, you know, he talks about, the way sometimes for a writer, the entire work appears to you in a flash as if like a landscape has been lit by strobes. Right. But the strobes also fade and you only get that one glimpse of it. And then you have to go back to the darkness and build the whole thing or feel your way through the whole thing. And when I, I had my, um, I, I had a uh, injury on the basketball court and my Achilles tendon ruptured. I mean, totally. Whoa. Ouch. Oh. And, uh, I the surgery to, to to reconstruct it was a like a six hour orthopedic surgery, God. and oh, so it was a deep uh, anesthetic episode. And in the recovery room, coming out of that, you know, kind of uh, quasi death, I saw Motherless Brooklyn just erupt into my my brain, and I grabbed uh, a, a, a pen from the nurse. Actually, I didn't even have anything with me, and I scribbled in the margins of a copy of a Raymond Chandler book I had with me. Um, and it was farewell, my lovely, uh, I had blank pages around the edges of the, the Chandler text. I scribbled as much as I could catch in this explosion of imagery and language that became motherless Brooklyn. So it, it, this, this chapter made me think about this because I'd also, of course, I'd made this selection. I was like, what book do I take to the hospital? Yeah, yep. to, That part made me to, laugh. Yeah. To read, you know, and I'd pick the Chandler, which influenced motherless Brooklyn huh. because then I had this hallucinatory, you know, anesthesia uh vision and it was a hard-boiled detective story that i that i hallucinated um so if i picked some other book you know if i'd taken tender as the night with me maybe i'd have written a, <laughs> uh, a romance instead i don't know that's incredible that, that 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 that's an incredible story and i love that like you say that part of like picking the book was one of my favorite parts of this of this too and i do say i had to say that the, this is fun because otherwise it does tap into my biggest anxieties so we've had like in the past on the, the podcast talking about people who want to be writers and like the the anxieties that some of these th some of these chapters sit a little close to home as for like you want to be a writer but you haven't been published yet and how that that interaction works and this one hits close to home for me for being like yeah like, you know yesterday i was like man i feel like my heart's not beating right <laughs> like maybe i should maybe i should go to the hospital yeah um, well one of these days you know we'll be we'll be right i know <laughs> about no, all, all no. the all the hypochondriacs are you know it's a dry run yeah <laughs> so john i have one question for you i'm because i'm a starting in my writing career you've obviously got a amazing CV of publishing when he's kind of peeling back the layers of some of the anxieties that writers face. Like I, I find myself identifying with a lot of it. Does it still hit home for you, even though you've had some success? Oh, of course. I mean, okay. you know, the thing is you're always, uh, you're always at sea, uh, and you're always, uh, wrangling your own, you know, the, the incommensurable, uh, distance between what you visualized or what you wanted to express and what, what sort of plopped out instead and how, you know, then, then you get a whole new set of circumstances, which is how people have taken it or, yeah. you know, you just, you're, you're, you're conscious of the kind of, um, you know, it's like, you're disappointed with everyone else. I know, I know. I, I wish I, I wish I had done, <laughs> wish I had written that book that you're wishing I'd written. Um, but, uh, you know, and Rodrigo's Rodrigo evokes all of this stuff. So, so beautifully because he's so, he's so, um, helplessly transparent about his, uh, his desires as a writer, his, you know, his, his, um, 
sense of there's some there's somewhere in a passage in here about you know for a moment being tempted to well he you know was more than briefly tempted to renounce it all mm-hmm. and he's thinking about um let me see if i can find this um the uh you know everything he's given to literature you know and how exhausting that is uh that oh, yeah. that he's lived his life in this um you know world of 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 uh books and the imagination and then the, the subsequent, you know, uh, petty transactions that surround it, you know, publishing anxieties or watching that, that, uh, kid you blurbed, you know, lap you several times. What is it? What is the nickname? <laughs> of it? yeah. Yeah. And, um, you know, and it's, it's so, it's just such a enormous and beautiful devotion. Uh, and, and Rodrigo gets that aspect of it on the page. And it's such a kind of a, drab and paltry life in many ways at the same time. And, and, you know, so at this moment in the hospital room, I think the, the, the writer, you know, who he's nicknamed the lonely man is, uh, is feeling the, the, the truth of both of the, the conjunction of both of those facts. Uh, and yeah, it never leaves you. I mean, you know, this is a, a typical issue with people's fantasies about, thresholds, you know, that you'll publish or you'll publish a bunch of books or you'll win an award and then everything will be like I wanted it. Then, right. you know, and that's, you know, it's not, um, it's, it's, your, your life can't be made right by the fact that you have some things that some other people wish they, they had. It, uh, um, I mean, you know, for better or worse, that didn't that fixes nothing. <laughs> It's interesting. There's like I was thinking a lot today because I was working on a, a post about this book um, for the section prior to this one, where mm-hmm. with the young man is always wanting to be a writer, but he wants to be a writer for like the fame of it, for the attention of it, for the like thingness of it. Yeah. Um, and then that gets very starkly contrasted in this chapter, where it's almost like it's almost uncontrollable. Like there's mm-hmm. all the anxieties and all the the issues that you're talking about, and at the same time, like the writer can't not not create. Um, in well, a way. right, it becomes a you know, before you no- notice, you know, you've been living with books instead of people. I, I mean, yeah. it's very poignant, I think. And, and the funicular as the image, which is in this chapter, uh, becomes a, a kind of a uh, allegory of, you know, what is it to l- lift yourself out of the world of people and look at them from far away and fantasize about them? And, you know, and suddenly life, your life consists of this mediation, you know, as much as literature is an art, it's also a kind of a, 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 a enormous muffling costume you're wearing through life, through which people have become more distant and difficult to apprehend directly. Right. And, um, you know, this has a, tra- a kind of a, almost a tragic component. And, you know, he calls the writer the lonely man here, uh, you know, which I think is, um, is a, you know, confession. Um and yeah, you know, yes, and and there's this right helpless generation of you know. So what does he say? It's so hard to turn off an unsound mind inside the unsound body of a writer. Yeah, <laughs> that's um, a great line too. Yeah, there's yeah, it really does have that that component to it of like yeah, not being able to turn off, not being able to like ever quite get there. I yeah, I really like I like the way that he writes about being a writer and being so invested in that part. Like there's there's a bunch of this that comes up later in the book too, and maybe a little bit before of like his writing and his devotion to writing and devotion to books. Like once you get absorbed into it and it's all consuming. And this goes for writers and I think also goes for a lot of people in publishing and reviewing or wherever. Like you do live through books. Um and it's almost like there's no way to turn off. There's no way to step out of that. There's no way to like dis- disengage yourself from that perspective. And it is, it is very lonely, I think, at times. Yeah, well, and, you know, it's embarrassing. <laughs> I mean, it, that's why you also have, you know, you have like this counterpoint is like the, the writer who disavows, you know, Hemingway who becomes a man of action or uh, people who, who will just say, I don't know any, I'm just a storyteller. I don't know about all that literary stuff. You know, people who are sort of... Um, anti-intellectual writers, you know, want right. to be like Jackson Pollock. I just fling some stuff on the canvas and, 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 you know, I mean, I, I just have always found that sort of, um, uh, symptomatic of, of, a you know, but anti, anti-intellectualism and culture in general, that mm-hmm. it, it should make someone so anxious to be thought of as living among words and language and books. But there is a moment when it becomes a kind of a trap or, you know, I mean, the thing about, devoting yourself to language is that it's um it's 
it, you know, it, it condemns you, even if you just think, oh, I, 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 I only really like stories. You know, I mean, I didn't start out thinking I wanted to um, uh, be a, a, a self-conscious or philosophical writer or one whose work was elusive or metafictional. I really, you know, grew up de- uh, devouring tales. You know, I yeah. wanted to, I wanted to, but the, but once you're inside, you realize, oh, this is how consciousness makes itself in the world, and language is a mysterious trap. And I'm forced to become interested in, in its self-conscious or plastic or formal properties because um, I, I'm, I'm now I'm living here, you know. Yeah, there is too. Like the the writer, the writer in the book has like that the constant struggle between like his writing and his being in that world and being fully invested in that world. And then the kind of his counter is that he gets very angry at times or like dislikes, like the contemporary world they see around him that is existing outside of books yeah. in a way. And like that, the anger that like, there's a bit where he's like, well, he, he gets upset and hulks out at all these things and like loses his shit. And that's le- what's led him to the hospital <laughs> because he's like always raging against things and his blood pressure is rising and whatever else. And it is that kind of balance between like, we love this thing. We love books. We love being in this world. And enjoy it, and there's people who who are completely outside of it that are almost almost foreign at times, um, where you don't understand, or, or or then people inhabit it, the world of books and sort of muddle it up or make it the thing that you don't want it to be, not as pure, and yeah. all that kind of dealing with all those emotions within this thing that we've invested ourselves into is very complicated. Yes, uh, I mean, and and I mean, there, are, you know, I mean, it's Henry James who says the house of fiction has many doors. There's, you know, I think one of the things that's so interesting in this chapter is the uh among the things he rages against not just you know cell phones in the modern world or mm-hmm. or but uh alice monroe winning the nobel prize <laughs> right <laughs> that there's this fantasy even within literature of the kind of um more direct you know check or uh i mean he he picked alice monroe i might as an american be particularly sensitive to the uh the the you know, and also teaching sometimes in MFA programs, as I've done, to the um, idea of someone like uh, Raymond Carver, that there's this sort of uh, minimalist, you know, they called it dirty realism at one point, kind of um, uh, strict, pure evocation of what life really feels like that's much, much more, you know, authentic, and that, and that obviously aggravates uh, Rodrigo as much as it does me, because those writers are also working with, you know, conventions and, and, you know, that there are all sorts of implicit kind of, um, you know, that, that, that the opposition that's being set up here is really false. But, but, you know, in, in, in this chapter, the lonely man, one of the things he seems to flirt with is what if I could just go back and, and start all over and be like Alice Monroe and, and, you know, that, and, and, and get rid of all this overthinking and all of this, uh, referentiality and, and, you know, uh, metafictionality and just, uh, you know, do these like stories about children or fathers and, and loss and death in the most immediate possible way. But then he begins to write them and even writing them as kind of projections in this chapter, they get more interesting. You know, That's true. They begin to overflow the Alice Monroe or, or, you know, Chekhov container and become metafictional because he can't help it. It's what, you know, it's what his engine is producing. Very true. Thought you were going to say something. Sorry. <laughs> oh no, I'm just wandering, wander, <laughs> wandering aimlessly in the sea with this book. I think it was. I can't remember. I just came across a quote. It was either David Bowie or maybe it was uh, Mama June or something that said, "As an artist, the best place is to kind of be in a in a pool where your feet aren't quite touching the bottom." And like over and over and over again, I feel like I keep coming back to that with this with this work where you're just there's no footing there's no yeah yeah, rodrigo didn't give you a chance to to um organize that kind of like okay this is what's really happening you know it's always uh it's breath yeah it's i think it's his signature is that breathlessness it goes back to loneliness as well because like you can never like it's just you and just kind of tumbling in a way Yeah. yeah yeah well and you know that's that's his image of how you, you know, tumble through culture and you tumble through experience. Uh, he's reproducing that uh, sensation, you know, um, that you might suddenly find yourself reckoning with death and, 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 and your feeling is of an interruption to something that you had only barely begun to say or, or, or you know, to, to, to think about. Um, 
So a funny part of this book that kind of hit home to me when I was reading it, there's the, he kind of goes with some of the irony of uh, hospitals, like a welcome sign or being a patient or that sort of thing. Yeah. And my wife works at a hospital here in Rochester and I drop her off every morning and it's, it's called Strong Memorial Hospital. So it's, there's memorial in the title of the hospital, which is like, makes me think of death while you're going to the hospital. And then there's the children's hospital that overlooks the cemetery. Every single window is looking out at a cemetery, it seems like. I, just, I remember just, when I, as I'm reading this, thinking like, who, who planned to put the hospital across the street from the cemetery? Was this like back when transportation wasn't good and they just wanted to wheel you down the hill right into the hole or something? And then even then, the cemetery is called Mount Hope. So you have the Hope Cemetery and the Memorial Hospital. They're right next to each other. The whole thing's ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah. The, uh, the cemetery in Los Angeles, which is t- typically has this sort of, um, uh, it has like a billboard because it's oh. Los Angeles. <laughs> the, um, uh, this is Forest Lawn. And it said, it, it, it says, um, voted, uh, voted overwhelmingly voted the world's most popular cemetery. And I'm like, who voted? What? The, <laughs> the dead? Their votes have been recorded. I mean, who's, Who's the one to judge the popularity? Of it? It's I, I, something about that. I always think of these these dead, you know, being tallied. Yeah, that, that, that's uh, and also they don't have any basis of comparison. They've never been buried anywhere else. Well, I've been laid to rest in several places. The dirt composition here is one of my favorites. I think for comfort and for and for rest. Yeah, I love that it's most popular too. Just I, popular for what? Yeah. Well. You know, hospitals. Are, I, I'm, I'm, I'm. I mean, I. You know, I have a hospital sequence in in Gambler's Anatomy, which it, uh, which made me feel also a kinship with this book. That that both of them have these sort of the interruption of the the you know the death image, and uh, I I linger uh, more extensively uh, on it because my character actually is you know um, you know mortally ill, whereas Rodrigo's character kind of um, skirts the edge but um there are all sorts of really great you know he alludes to this sort of the the surgeon as this colonizing figure or invader or it's also very sexual someone who like splits you open and puts things in you and reaches into you and yet you know and he also talks about the uh, what is it um he's um oh yeah okay so here's my favorite quote probably um that's pretty much it for him as protagonist invalid the exception being more a cure than an ailment, the understandable and wondrous and wholesome and purifying and disaffecting cataclysm every time he finished and submitted and extracted and amputated, suddenly overcome with relief, a new book from his system. It's like the book is the tumor and it yeah. needs to be removed from you. I just thought that was so fantastic. And, um, you know, and, and the surgeon is a rival figure, really, in many ways. It's not just that, you know, you're going along happily, you know, in this magisterial kind of Henry James, I am the master, I, 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 I write novels, and no one else can do that. It's a kind of quasi-heroic figure, and then the surgeon is so much more monumentally, you know, holds life and death in, in, in the hand. But also, the surgeon is accorded all this power and status because they, you know, they do something no one else can do, but it also involves going in. Right. And that's what the novelist does. They go in, they diagnose, they open it up, they show you the inside, except not really. <laughs> the surgeon really could like reach in there and pull, pull that shit out and wave it around like, oh, you, oh that's the problem. Look at that. <laughs> you know? The novelist never gets that like absolute authority, you know. Oh, yeah, we'll put them back together without the bad shit in there. You know, it just doesn't work. So. <laughs> So, but the closest you can come is to expel the book from you, you know, is to, is to at least, you know, um, have this evidence that something came out. It may not be any good. It may not be of any use. It may, it's, you know, doesn't, it, it doesn't, doesn't help anyone else, but, um, but you did, you know, you did get it out. That's really interesting. All right. So I got, I got to circle back, uh, I have to ask you about blurbs because there's a, <laughs> there's a section in here about blurbs and I may be wrong, but I swear I've seen you blurb a ton of stuff. Do, um, you, do, you, do, a, do you do a lot of blurbs? I did. I was a, a, a congenital, to use a medical term, I was a congenital blurbist. And um, I've, congenital. Been, I've been boycotting it for quite a while now. And actually, I'm in like uh, su- supreme good faith, which I shouldn't brag about, but I, I will. And it'll be on, on, on your podcast that I've been bragging about this. I don't accept blurbs anymore. Uh, I decided if I was going to stop 
being willing to blurb anyone else's book, I should stop asking for them too. So I, without oh. anyone noticing, it's like, um, what's the, the George Carlin routine? A man has barricaded himself inside of his house. However, he is unarmed and no one is paying the slightest bit of attention to him. Uh, <laughs> I, I've actually gone four or five books now without a, without a single new blurb on them. And no one has ever remarked on this, but now I'm, I'm doing it myself. And wow. I, 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 no, you know, you've made it when your name is bigger than the title no, you know, and there's no, and there's no blurbs. You've given up. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you, you know, you've hit your plateau and there's no point. Um, when you stop bothering to ask for the blurb. Um, but, uh, uh, yeah, I, there are plenty of mine circulating, and that's the thing is they never die. They, they, they yeah. just as you guys reused um, this one from yep. Kensington Gardens, they, they, they don't go away. Uh, no, I'm just curious though, like you know, a little bit of real talk. Like when you do, when you have to write a blurb, or when you accept to write a blurb, uh, to me, there's like it seems like there's two types. Like there's one that says, "Wow, that's a book," or "Wow, that's an author." <laughs> Oh, like, right. do you, oh, how like, do you figure out which one you're going to do? And do you kind of phone them in or how, how does this, how does the blurbing work? You don't have to name names or anything. I'm just curious. <laughs> I want to look under the hood for a second here. Oh, <laughs> you know, I mean, uh, people, most of the ones that actually happen are because, uh, uh, either, and you know, the writer came to their friend or acquaintance or, or someone they, they admire and wrote a really great kind of fan letter to, you know, and said, I, I, I got a galley and I, I, I hate to do this, but would you look at it? And the person said that they would, they would consider doing it. There's usually some, some kind of adjacency or, you know, sometimes there'll be an editor in common or an agent in common. And this is, this is pretty normal. Like, you know, I, uh, I, I got to blur, uh, Colson Whitehead's first novel because it was acquired by my editor, uh, at Doubleday. And he was like, "You're gonna like this, and also it needs it needs something." And and, and, to you. and I, I was, I'm really gonna like you know, this, but please I, hook it up. Totally, yeah. uh, crazy about the book, um, and so that's like a best case scenario. But in any event, that's moral. You know, some some version of that is how these things occur. Because if you get just get sent sent cold galleys, unless you're really like a blurb and fool, and you're like, "I need something to blurb today." You mostly just put those in a pile and, and, and don't think about them or write a polite letter back to the publicist. But it's when someone has a little bit of a, a purchase on you, you know, of, of, of having been in your classroom or, um, or, or, you know, or, or you've had a good time with them one night after, you know, in, in, uh, at some international um, book festival, you know. <laughs> you were sitting in the, in the bar of the Sydney hotel at you know during the uh the sydney book festival and you you know you you shared some some secrets with them and then then they you know six months later their their letter arrives and they're like oh, yeah, i guess i'm gonna oh, look at your book okay you love david cronenberg i love david cronenberg <laughs> but it's a queasy i mean everyone knows to apologize and they do it's a queasy business no one's no one's happy about it all you know um it's it's and everyone's wondering if there's an uh, escape hatch and i i don't i don't claim that my own personal you know blurbatorium is some sort of high pull. Uh, <laughs> the blurbatorium <laughs> a whole book of just blurbs yeah. i am I, um, I it's it was just it was just my personal escape hatch it's not like that's going to fix everything uh, if everyone would just hold hands and stop blurbing we would never have to think about this again um you know uh <laughs> It's you know, I it's almost like a life cycle thing. When I was when I was a young man, I needed I needed someone to blurb me, and then for a little while, I was a you know, I had the energy to be a generous blurber, and now I'm a tired old crank, and I don't do it anymore. <laughs> someone else. <laughs> I love it. When we did, um, at, when I worked at Delkey Archive, we published um, Harry Matthews' collected stories and then his collected essays. And I don't think we ever put it together, but we were we were going to do his collected blurbs as like a pamphlet to hand out as like the publicity material. You know who? You know who actually um, put their blurbs in hard covers is Allen Ginsberg. In his collect, really, in his collected nonfiction, there's a whole stretch of these little tiny, not even quite essays. And you're like, what the hell am I reading? And you're like, oh my god. Those are all his blurbs. He just collected all his blurbs. They're in hard oh my God. That's kind of amazing. <laughs> Gary Steinkart could do that and like publish a multi-volume work. Yeah, but his his are he, Gary. Gary's in a very weird uh, territory. He's he he like advertised that he would blurb anything, and you start to look at them really funny when you've heard you you know you when you realize we, his name is on like 
40 novels in a you know. I read a blurb from him that said, pick up this book and buy it now. That's what the blurb, it was just telling me instructions. <laughs> like, it wasn't even, <laughs> pick up the book and buy it. Uh-uh. So we have a blurb from him for a book that, um, uh, this story is, is not super confidential, so I'll, I'll share it with everyone. <laughs> um, and, and whatever, we'll, we'll, we'll explode all myths right now. But, um, Amanda Michalopoulou, uh, French, or Greece, Greek author that we have, uh, that we published one of her books, she met him at some festival and said that he would blurb her book. So I sent it to him and 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 emailed him and was like, you know, Gary, here's here's this thing, the whole sorry, you know, whatever. Would you be willing to look at it? And he's like, well, what would you say if you blurbed it? And I was like, I guess I would say this. And I wrote something and he's like, that's exactly what I would say. So why don't we go with that one? <laughs> I was like, yeah. good enough. He became, you know, you know what would be really horrible would be like to be the one person who Gary didn't blurb. <laughs> oh. That was rough. <laughs> like when I was a when I was a bookseller, we used to joke about um, finding a a, a rare uh, unsigned first edition of a Ray Bradbury book. Oh man, <laughs> that's that, that good. Where were you a bookseller at? Oh, all over. I mean, I, I worked at a series of used bookstores in Brooklyn and and um, that are all gone. And then I I worked at uh, a nice shop on uh, Broadway in Manhattan called Griffin um, before I left before I left for California. That's still there, I think, on on Broadway between 80th and 81st. And then I I lived in Berkeley, and for 10 years I was a bookseller in Berkeley at um, first at, uh, at uh, Pegasus Books and Pendragon, which was one company with two shops, and then at Moe's, which is... Like, oh, okay. So, Chad, if you read The Agony of Ecstasies, you would true. know this. <laughs> this that. is true. I never get that title right, yeah, but I love I loved it by the way. <laughs> For, the Fortress of Agony. Uh, yeah, the, the Fortress, yeah, of, Agony. The Fortress <laughs> of Agony. If you ever read any of his books, though, yeah. <laughs> All right, we got to wrap this up. Let's do. Fa- we want to do favorite. Uh, sure. Favorite parts, so we can get him out of here because he has important things to do, like write books before he dies. <laughs> Let, I'll, actually, I'll start off. Um, in honor of the uh, 13th installment of Transformers coming out, um, I'll do this line from uh, page 248. Uh, he sees a kid playing with Transformers and uh, thinks it's kind of interesting, the Autobots and Decepticons. And so he says, There was a time, thinks the lonely man, when people related to books like that, two by one. What the writer gave you and what you did with it inside your own head. Now, not so much, less and less. It's not the content that matters. It's the packaging, the device, the latest model, like mirrors and colored glass, reading on it all the time, more and ever, but in homeopathic doses. Yeah, that's an amazing bit. Uh, I'm really glad you you honed in on that. Uh, it's funny because I've got it. I've got it like bracketed to. Um, <laughs> And and I underline the whole the whole last bit. I mean, I, I'm tempted just to keep going because I have the the lines I underlined were right after that. Go right, for it. And writing more than ever, but also writing more about nothing. And the truth is, the lonely man couldn't care less about these issues, which he thought and wrote about a great deal in another era, another dimension, just yesterday, in the days when he was healthy or at least felt healthy. So it's really funny because, and then I wrote above that on. I just wrote before and after. So you like represented the the young writer's viewpoint where you're still like. Uh, waving your fist at all this crapola, and then there's that turn, and the part I read is the after. It's like, and then you realize, you know, twas ever thus, and we will all leave this mortal coil, blah blah blah. And I can't believe I spent a lot of time like shaking my fist at video games or transport. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the things are real and tangible, you know, and that's what's great about the paragraph is that it's got it's got it all. It's true. That's true. My favorite one that I had marked is like. Almost like a, a good corollary to that is on 297 is because the world must be full of people who don't read or write and who nevertheless are happy and normal, right? <laughs> it's even possible that they're more normal and more happy. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> well, that's it. I mean, you know, there's the ultimate mystery. I mean, we all talk about like the, the other and, you know, everyone has like the, you know, there's the racial other or the gender other or, you know, the, the living wondering about the world of the dead. But the those who read and and love books wondering what's going on in the heads of the ones who just are seem fine without any of that uh it's a it's yeah. a really mysterious tribe absolutely absolutely i totally agree well let's celebrate intrinsic loneliness together if we can right <laughs> sounds like a plan yeah <laughs> oh man well thank you very much for coming on this is fantastic that was a guess great great talking and and 
Oh, sorry, go on. I'm just really glad you're doing the 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 book the the job of publishing this 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 beautiful monster uh, in English. That is yes, a, a, all all of them. We're going to do all three of the books, and uh, it's and the, a, along with two other books of his, The Bottom of the Sky, which I think you're really going to like. It, I, not that you don't like this, but I think you're going to hone in on that too because that is the science fiction. I've been waiting for that one. He he alluded Ooh. to it. Rodrigo told me about it and it kind of taunted me with it. I couldn't. Uh, you got to blurb that shit. It's damn good. <laughs> yeah. I, <laughs> you should just blurb. Just make a new. We should change like two words in your blurb and just keep <laughs> reusing it. Like one variation instead of kaleidoscopic, use like something else. Instead of open hearted, close hearted. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> fun, but um, for everyone listening, next week we're going to be talking about the next section, which goes from page three hundred two to three sixty, um, and this is this is another one of these uh, ones that's more of a list. So we'll have a lot of fun with that. But thanks again, Jonathan. This was fantastic. Thanks, guys. Talk to you later. Just